Today we are talking about words we know but seldom use. Words like bloom and flourish. We will talk about them in ways to help you rethink your work, your team, your leadership, and your life. I know that's a big promise, but it's a promise that I am confident we will deliver on today. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders to grow, bloom, flourish personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you are listening to this podcast, you could have been here live, or you actually, you could be here future in the future for live episodes on your favorite social media platform. And you can get information about when those are and who they're with and all of those things. And therefore, join us and interact with us like some are doing here uh, by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to uh, remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. Of course, Remarkable Podcast is where you can find everything at remarkablepodcast.com where you can find everything about this show, all the past episodes, etc. cetera. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by our latest book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more and get an excerpt at longdistanceteambook.com. That's longdistanceteambook.com. And now I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is introduce our guest. I'm going to bring him in here. You can see his smiling face and the flowers that are moving behind him. Uh, and let me introduce him. His name is Dan Pontefract, and he is a renowned leadership strategist, author, and keynote speaker with over two decades of experience in senior executive roles at companies like SAP, TELUS, and Business Objects. Since leaving those roles, he has worked with organizations around the world, including Salesforce, Amgen, the state of Tennessee, the government of Canada, Nestle, Canada, po Canada Post, Autodesk, BMO, and many more. Um, as an award-winning and best-selling author, he's written five books. His latest, which isn't even out, you are getting a preview. The new book is called Work Life Bloom. There's that word bloom again, and that will be our focus today. He uh, has done many, many, many keynotes, as we, as I mentioned before, including four TED events, and is an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria's Gustafson School of Business. He's listed on a lot of lists, including a couple that I'm on as well. He's on the Thinkers 50 Radar, HR Weekly's 100 Most Influential People in HR, People Hum's Top 200 Thought Leaders to Follow, and Inc. Magazine's Top 100 Leadership Speakers. And today, it is my pleasure to have him as our guest. Dan, welcome. So glad you're here. Kevin, so good to be here, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. We've got people from Long Island. And upstate New Oh, hello, Ms. Coppett. Uh, like, I don't, I don't think it's only people from New York today that are going to get value out of this, so I will say. Uh, so uh, I, I am excited for this conversation. Let's just start. Like, you didn't wake up in Hamilton, Ontario as a kid and say, I'm going to be a business business author someday. Like, <laughs> like, you know, you were thinking fireman, astronaut, police officer, I don't know, steel worker, I don't know. Um, so like, Tell us a little bit, short version of the journey that gets you to do in the work you do today. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and hello, New York State, apparently. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Kevin, I, I suppose I've always as a kid thought about like, how am I going to help others? And maybe that was some sort of prescient, precocious kid that I was um, back in the day in Hamilton. But I, I just, you know, whether I was captain of a soccer team, a volleyball team, basketball team, president of student council, like I was always in these leadership roles that I didn't know were leadership roles. And I always worried about the other guy, the other gal, the neighbor, the teammate. So I think it was in me. I don't know why God did, did, did what he did or she did to me, but that's what's happened. And I sort of ran with that baton to uh, the next track meet. Well, that's, and so we... I think that's a good way to think about it. It's a journey that we're on. And, and uh, while on a track meet, we sort of know where the finish line is, uh, you know, in, in, I think in most of our cases, I mean, you know, Dan, I've asked most every one of my guests over time that question, because I think it's useful to give people number one, a sense of who is this person mm -hmm. that they're going to learn, learn from and learn with, but also uh, to remind, I, I think a lot of people, and people have told me this, that, that listen to the show, watch the show, 
say, you know, you have luminaries on, you have people that I've looked up to for a long time and those kinds of things. And, and it's, it's helpful to know that it's not like there's always a perfect plan. Uh, so wherever I am, I can move in, in the direction of that makes sense uh, and how I felt led, feel led and, and good things can happen. So um, we talked about your journey, which is a journey of both life and work. And one of the first things you say in this book, and it's probably, it, it's the, it's, perhaps the single biggest idea of the book. You say that we need, get ready, everybody, that we need to demarcate work from life. So first of all, that's probably the first time the word demarcate has been used on this podcast. Uh, but what does that mean really to you? And so what does it mean? And why are you making the bold statement? Well, uh, first of all, there's a a glaring myth that is utterly BS these days. And that is the, the leaders and organizations who espouse work-life balance. And right away, I'm saying to you, Kevin, that that's impossible. It's a zero sum game. And so if work-life balance is a zero sum game and a myth, then we need to demarcate work and life because they're not one thing. One doesn't I, my argument, Kevin, is you can't tuck work into life. You have to, and leaders need to first think about, well, what are the factors in work that we need to consider for people to flourish or bloom? And then what are the factors in life that relate back to work that we need to be thinking about? So to demarcate means to delineate, means to divide, means to look at these as separate entities. Yeah, I have often called it a myth as well, but I love this idea of it, uh, well, of, of thinking of it as a zero-sum game, like you can't get there, right? And and even if there was such a thing, it's so, and you make this point throughout that the book, that it's going to necessarily be what that what that is, if if there was such a thing as a balance. It's going to be different for everyone. It's going to be different for us at different parts in our life. And for some of us in different times of the year, like, if you're a farmer and it's May, it's different than if it's November. If you're a, if you're in the U.S. and you're an accountant in April, it's different than it might be in August, right? Like we could go on and on totally. and on. So, so like I really love this, and and it's so interesting, everybody. So the book is called Work Life Bloom: How to Nurture a Team That Flourishes. Three words in there that all relate to growing things. Uh, and as a farm kid, that immediately drew me to the nice. book. Nice. Uh, and yet. That big idea we just talked about is not what people would be thinking about when they see the title of this book. Um, and, and so I, I want us to go there in a minute. But if if this is a show called the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, and if in the introduction that you largely wrote, uh, <laughs> it says you are a leadership strategist, what does all of this have to do with leadership? Like, after all, aren't we here about work? Like, hello? Yeah. Well, one of the things we've also been espousing in addition to work-life balance BS, Kevin, uh, is employee engagement BS. So I'm guilty. I've been in this world of leading organizations and teams from an HR engagement performance perspective. And I had a hard look at the data. And the data suggests, as you know all too well, Kevin, that employee engagement effectively has not materially changed in 25 years. It sticks globally around 20% in America. It's around 35% in Canada. It's about 34% and so on. And so I was like, well, if we're spending billions of dollars on leadership and culture and engagement and nothing is happening, either I'm a terrible leader, leadership strategist <laughs> Or we're actually looking at the equation wrongly. And so that's what I want to tell Which we are. Because yeah. the thing is, well, can I just make a comment here? Uh, and that is that the problem is that uh, once we started measuring it, we think leaders should be doing something about it. When the reality is, it's a choice that everybody makes. Like, I choose to be engaged or not. And there are things I can that a leader can do to help me make that choice. But it's not something we do to people. Agreed? This is exactly it. And I, I kind of make the point in the book, as a leader, you have to remember this line. Our lives shape our work. Nevertheless, our work shapes us. 
And to your point about seasons, I wanted to pick up on that, Kevin, because that's actually the point. If you metaphorically looked at seasons inside of the uh, inside of the organization, and you say, look, you're not just the accountants in April, but when an organization has been acquired and you now have a new boss or you've uh, moved cities and you don't feel like you belong in that city or you don't have a network anymore or your child has run away and you're not sure where that child is. Do you think that any, any of those situations are going to affect your work or your life? And if we're yeah. leaders, of, if we're yeah, but if we're leaders of a human being, why do we stop leading or helping them to lead the balance that's uh, or the balance that's impossible, rather the integration of the two? That's what I think we should be thinking about. Yeah, I, I remember my team. I got a message. She's actually off, uh, planned to be off uh, the rest of this week, but she sent me a note early this morning saying that. I knew that her grandfather was ill, that her grandmother, her grandfather passed away. So do you think that's not going to have an impact for her? Of course it is. Yeah. Right. And, and we can sort of say, sure. But then what most of us do is, and I'm saying this to remind myself too, right. That we can't just like, okay, that happened. And now she'll be back next week. No. I mean, yes, she'll be back. In the, she'll be back at her desk next week, but it's not the same person that was here last week or three weeks ago before her grandfather went into hospice. Well, this brings up my third myth that I really want to also layer on here because that's exactly the point. When we tell our employees, our team members that we want their, we want them to bring Kevin their most authentic, best whole self into the organization. Yet leaders are oblivious, if not deleterious towards that situation that they're coming from, whether that's the loss of a grandfather, the new city domain, let's say, you know, lack of networks and relationships in the new city, whatever the case may be. If you're not open to that scenario, what type of employee do you think they're going to be in the organization? Will they be their most authentic self or will they be someone slightly potentially damaged or just hurt or maybe not 100% in performance? And what do you as a leader do? Do you reprimand them? Do you ignore it? Well, most of us ignore it. And in, in, the, in the case that we're talking about here, we may ignore it because, well, you ignore it either intentionally or unintentionally. We're not, it's a blind spot. We're not even aware that they're having trouble in their new city. Uh, or we don't know what to say. So we don't say anything, but in either case, it feels like ignoring to the other person, mm -hmm. which leaves them in a very, in not a great spot, right? Totally. I mean, they feel left out, lost. They don't belong. They don't feel valued. There's no respect. Like you can go on with some of the obvious work-life We're going to get to those words in yeah, a minute, yeah. everybody. It's <laughs> a little preview, a little <laughs> foreshadowing. Um, so I said it in the open, words like bloom. And, and, and even though... You know, everything we've talked about so far, we've ended up talking about growing, right? We talked about seasons. We're talking, we're going to talk about this word bloom. Like this is the word you're saying we ought to be using. Uh, and so, and, and then there's three other words that you, you suggest we have to think about as well. But like, why bloom? What do you mean by bloom? What's the <laughs> metaphor here? Let's start there. And then we'll get some other words as well. Yeah. Well, the reason for bloom is I was like quite literally on a bike ride. I like cycling a lot outside. And um, this is about two years ago. And I'm in the midst of, you know, essentially designing the book in my head and on paper and so forth. And I literally ran into on my bike, this just wonderful array of uh, spring flowers here in Victoria, British Columbia, where I live. And I thought to myself, wow, we just had a terrible winter for us. I mean, it was quite wet and rainy and cold. And then here are these flowers, like, and literally the word blooming came to my mind, like blooming, like they're, look at these early spring risers. And then I started thinking about the season. I started thinking about the metaphor about the garden box, like, or in soil and how seeds never see the, the light of day until water and nutrients and, and tending to that um, soil can allow for the flower or the veg to bloom. And I'm like, God, that's a pretty good metaphor when it comes to what we might need to be doing as a leader. And I just, you know, wrestled with that, marinated in the moment of the metaphor. And then I said, that's a pretty good word to maybe introduce to leaders. So 
you say that so so let's let's sort of tie that to this we're going to get we said that work and life aren't things we put in balance but there are factors in both cases we'll get to all those factors in a minute but but when you think about work and life you you say that blooming is when what like define it for us so people have a context of where we're yeah heading. honestly i'm like basically i'm kind of like uh thinking about eisenhower's uh two by two in when i'm thinking about the blooming and in this case though i'm saying well, instead of being engaged and not engaged and chronically engaged and slightly engaged, and if like the whole point is that it just seems to me that maybe we're asking the wrong question. So what I, I kind of landed on blooming as being a persona. When you bloom, that's a persona that you actually can uh, adapt or adopt if the conditions are right. So the soil, the nutrients, the leadership, you know, and so forth. And then I thought, well, if we're not blooming, we must be something else. And so if you picture a two by two matrix on the Y axis work and on the X axis life, and if work is going really well and life is going really well, or at least the life skills that I talk about, the life factors, then arguably you should be blooming as a persona. But, but there are three, if we have a two by two matrix by definition, uh, and by the way, you have now written five leadership books. So there has to be a two by two matrix in one of them. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, but no, you know, the reason that we use them is because they're helpful. Uh, so you got three other words, you got three other quadrants. So we can think, you know, work factors, life factors, both going great, blooming. Give us the other three real quick. We're going to focus on blooming today, but, but give us the other three so people get the context. Yeah. Well, I, I did get a note from the writer's guild that said I hadn't used a two by two matrix yet in any of the books. So I was being penalized by not having one. So I had to put one in, Kevin. I, I need to um, make a note of this. Uh, um, I okay, so, I'm more than five in. I don't think I have one. I've got to get after this. I'm just saying, you might get penalized. The the, the guild will come after you. Uh, in the top left, so imagine work is going really well, but your life factors are not. I call that budding. So again, we're playing on the garden and growing metaphor here. Budding is you're close because work is going really well, but those life factors are not going well. So you're budding. You're like, I want to bloom, but I'm quite not quite there. So can the leader help me with that? The reverse, of course, is in the bottom right of the two by two. That's when your life factors are shooting through, but work feels like nails on a chalkboard. And so in that you're stunted because there's this, whereas budding looks positive or sounds positive and stunted sounds negative, that's actually intentional. Because if you feel in your life factors that you can bust through, but yet it's work that's getting in the way, you're arguably stunted. You're like, okay, what do I got to do here? Is it the boss? Is it the team? Is it me? I might have to do something about this. Right? At any plant, right? Now the farmer- That's just it. it, it yeah. you know, the plant knows what it wants to do. It really wants to. It just can't. Yeah. It just can't. Yeah. We got one more. Yeah. So I still look at this as a positive opportunity, and that's when work and life are not going so hot from the factor consideration, and you're in need of renewal. So renewal is not negative. It's that you've come to the conclusion, hopefully with your leader or organizational team of some sort, and said, what is getting in the way of me renewing? It doesn't mean the organization's bad and you're bad. It could be, but it often means I'm looking at these factors with a, a touch of negativity, what do I need to assist me to maybe get up to one of the other three personas? Renewal, stunted, budding, blooming, uh, and, and all of them related to these things that we keep referring to as the work factors and the life factors. So everybody, there are six of each, and there's no way that we're going to be able to unpack all of that. That's why when this book comes out, which it isn't now, um, they can go to Amazon and pre-order now, yes? They can indeed, sir. There you go. Go to Amazon or wherever you buy your books online or go to your local bookseller. Tell them you want a copy. Work, Life, Bloom, How to Nurture a Team That Flourishes. So we're still mostly talking about us. We haven't gotten to the team part. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so just very quickly, give us the six work factors, then we'll get to the life factors in a sec. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have you just tell us the six, okay. and then I'm going to pick one for yeah. us to talk about. And then if you want us to talk about one, we can do that too. Fair? All right. The Go. six. And by the way, I did primary global research to get to these. So it wasn't me making them up out of the, you know, wet fingering the sky, Kevin. So 
10,000 people, 5,000 leaders, 5,000 non-leaders, 11 countries, including the United States of America, helped me figure out what these factors were. So the six work factors, uh, trust, belonging, valued or feeling valued, I will say, uh, purpose, strategy, and norms, which is sort of like the the things that get in the way of like processes, bureaucracy, like what are my non-friction type norms to get stuff done? So the kind of operating culture. So we could talk about any of them. And, uh, and you know, if you we were to pick, um, if we were to pick the one that I have the most passion about, which is the number one, which is trust, we could do that. But we've talked about trust in the show and, 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 and not to minimize it, but I, yeah. I picked belonging. So mm. specifically from the research and in the book, like, what do you mean? What does this mean? There are three things that it sort of means or are inside of that. What is that? Um, tell us about that. Yeah, well, so for me, in in the research I was doing, so not only just the global research, but I interviewed like 220 people across the world, these one-on-one, -on -one, one hour focus group type uh, interviews. And belonging came out as sort of the computation of DEI. So diver diversity, equity, inclusion, so critical but it, the the outcome of that, ensuring that you have it, is actually that sense of belonging. And when we belong, we feel as though that we're part of something, somewhat obviously, Kevin, as you know. But then what happens is you have that residual effect. And when you have the residual effect of feeling like you belong, then you matter. And when you matter, you're doing all kinds of good things, ultimately. So oh, by me, the way, when we yeah. have that feeling... What's going to happen? Now, this is a question for all of you that can't respond uh, if you're listening. But if you're watching with us live, here's the question. If you have that feeling, if you feel like you belong, what happens to your level of engagement? It's, I, I While we're waiting for them all to answer. Like, they, it's obvious. It's obvious, right? It's yeah. going up. Belonging goes up. Engagement's going up. It's like, I feel like I belong. I'm going to choose to engage. I'm going to choose to be a part. I'm going to choose to, you can see why it's a part of blooming, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I know you, you asked me about the three and the three real key pedals, if you will, right, to belonging is, um, am, I, am I understood as a human being, what I'm bringing to the table? Do I feel represented both by my views, um, my identity, what I look like? And do I feel safe, paying homage a bit to Amy Edmondson's work, obviously, but do I feel safe emotionally, mentally, psychologically when I'm in the room and when I'm not in the room? Am I being, am I being held up to, if you will, by my leader when I'm not in a room so that I know that I'm feeling safe in any of my comments, whether they may be online or face-to-face -face or I'm not even there in the room? And that doesn't mean that I may not say something dumb, uh, but the people are going to uh, assume at minimum, as my good friend Guy Harris and co-author says, assume at least benign intent. Like there's nothing there. It's just, that's just what they said. Yeah. It is what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I said I was going to let you pick one as well, but I don't know with everything I want to cover if we have time to do that, uh, because I'm very aware, Dan, that the word co the synonyms for the word cover include bury and obscure. So let's, <laughs> let's just, I want to go to the life factors and um, what are the six life factors? So again, first of all, as a bit of a caveat or a disclaimer, um, life is not the life factors sorry, are not about how does the leader help the team member, um, you know, balance their checking book or should they have a garage sale on Saturday or what's the name of their new puppy? Like it's not, life in that regard it's about character so what are the character development factors that a leader ought to be paying attention to because clearly that team member needs to be as well if they want their quote life working in the right direction so the six are a sense of meaning do i feel meaning so worth basically right do i have a network which i call relationships so we know because of vivek murthy's point of the surgeon general saying uh, loneliness is now an epidemic in the U.S. That's not good. So relationships is number two. Uh, well-being, so your sense of wellness, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, obviously. Do you have skills? 
Like, are, is someone interested in the skill development of you? Are you interested in your own skills and the development of said skills? And then the last two are agency and respect. So what's the difference uh, in your context here between meaning and purpose? Ah. You've got one on, the perp one on the personal side, one on the life side, one on the work side. Um, difference, uh, how do you demarcate? Second time in one show, how do you demarcate <laughs> between the two? So I love that you picked on that. And, and often, um, perhaps there is a terrible Canadian book plug for me, but I wrote a book called The Purpose Effect. And that was in 2016. And so my thinking has evolved a little bit. I hope well, all our thinking evolves over seven years time. And purpose to me as a work factor is how the organization sets its intentions and its beliefs and actions and serving all stakeholders to, to serve and improve society on the whole. So when you're in a work factor and you're an employee, you need to be looking at the organization and hoping, wondering, and acknowledging that, in fact, they are serving all stakeholders, and there's an intention and a belief that we are going to serve community, et cetera. Meaning on a life factor is inward focused. It's about you. It's how you feel and exhibit that sense of self-worth on a daily basis. And then when you bring that into work, are you allowed to exhibit it? And does it does a sort of an equal equilibrium, if you will, happen between the leader saying, I get you. I understand your sense of meaning. How can I support you as a human being? So what would you say about how those two things can be integrated, to use your word from earlier? In other words, like... Uh, jokingly, like if I work, if I work for Outback Steakhouse and I'm a vegetarian, these things, things may not match up. Right. Uh, but, but like, how do you, how would you think about, or what advice would you give to people to help people integrate that? So like, I'm a leader and hopefully we're creating purpose and, and my team members see that. How do I help them integrate that with meaning on the life factor side? Yeah. So great question. And that's where it comes to, you know, as you know, all too well, Kevin, that's that, open dialogue a leader ought to be having with the team member to know a little bit more about what makes them click, tick, and actually shine. So from a self-worth um, perspective, that sense of meaning, that uh, daily sort of exhibiting of meaning, is the leader having a conversation about actually what their, their own interests are, like the team members, I should say, right, in terms of what brings them that sense of self-worth. And it's not as though you can uh, necessarily tie 100% of what you do in your job to your really good point about Outback to what it is that the organization's organizational purpose is, but you can have a dialogue and find ways in which to potentially have some mapping. So for example, if it's the like, let's just run with this one on the Outback, right? If you're a vegan or vegetarian and your sense of meaning has to do more with um, the cultivating of you know, a, a menu or your your life is about non-meat products that you're working at Outback. Well, what can that leader do to either help that individual in their non-work hours to feel that sense of meaning? But when it's about Outback and its purpose, which is to serve meat, can that leader have a conversation about other things that it might do or the, that he or she can do inside the restaurant that might fuel that? 100%. Right? It's just an open dialogue conversation. And when we put our head in the sand, as a leader and just pretend they're not vegan and pretend they're not a vegetarian. Good gosh, what happens? I mean, you know what happens. Exactly. So, you know, I think like five times during this 30 minutes, I've bumped up against this thought, Dan, and that is, so I'll make the comment. You can take it where you want. And that is that a lot of times as leaders, we're afraid to bring stuff up because we don't have an answer. Mm. Like we're afraid to ask the question we don't have the answer to because you know, we're the leader, we're the boss, we're supposed to know something, we're supposed to have some clue here. And so we're afraid to bring stuff up that we don't know how to deal with. Uh, and it feels like there's an example, what we just talked about, but I don't think it's the first one in this, uh, in this time. So what is your ad advice or counsel to leaders when they're feeling that? <laughs> well, uh, the Canadian crass in me says, get over it, you, you big jerk, you big dummy. But my sincere leadership strategist hat is like teaching them about the power of vulnerability. So when we're vulnerable and we come out, Kevin, and we say, you know what? I'd like to know more about that. I don't really know. 
if if leaders adopt the I'm the smartest person in the room mantra and they think that they are and they're not, you know, surrounding themselves or involving themselves in a higher learned way, being that autodidact, which is a fancy way to say just a continuous learner and asking the questions, can you educate me? Yeah, I know my title says manager or director, and I know your individual contributor or project lead or uh, sandwich maker, right, at Outback, but I I I don't know. It's okay, Kevin, to say, I don't know. That's humanity. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I tell leaders all the time, like, they don't even want our answers. They want our attention. Uh, they want our attention. They want our ears more than our ideas. And so if we're willing to do that, we, you know, I, we use, again, you and I, big fancy words like vulnerable and transparent, but the right word is human. Just be yes. human. Um, and if we do that, and if we think about the best leaders we've had, we would all say they were that. And yet too many of us hold ourselves to a standard of something else, which is just really silly. And, and we can we need to help get, get ourselves past that. Um, so uh, there's so much, Dan, that we can't get to. I'm looking at the clock and I'm trying to, to, to do what, with these shows what we always want to do in terms of time. And there's so much more we could uh, unpack, but we, we've talked about the, at a very high level, we've talked about the, the six work factors, the six life factors. And, and, and I'm guessing people were thinking about them for us as individuals, but what's one other idea you would share with us with our leader hat on in terms of how does this impact us? How does this, how do these ideas transform or how can they transform the way we lead? Well, I really hope we start having conversations about are you engaged or not at work? Because that's the wrong question. I think what we need to be asking about is how do you feel in work and life? And that's a big difference, right? Are you engaged or not? And how do you feel at work and in life? Because now you're talking about, as you said a few times now, the human, the humanity, the human being. No one checks their life at the work door, whether that's a Zoom call or the actual physical building you go to, and everybody brings home work, mentally and sometimes physically because of laptops and iPads and iPhones and so on, right? So we need to get over it. So can we have an honest dialectical conversation with our team members about, well, how are they feeling between work and life? If you wanna use the personas, great. It's a little simple two by two just to have a conversation. And then you can enter into different dialogues about the, the, the six work and the six life factors about, well, do you feel purpose here at work? Why or why not? Do you understand the strategy? Why or why not? Is there well-being going on in your life? Why or why not? How can I help with uh, any of those ways in which that yeah. it can happen? One of the things that I think, you know, that this idea that you're sharing, Dan, and, and, the, and the book can help us do one of the things I think that many leaders got way better at for a while during the early part of the pandemic, which was be more empathetic. Yeah. And really what you're doing is putting, is putting framework around how to be empathetic. Um, thoughts agree, disagree. That's really kind of you. It's such a, a wonderful articulation, possibly because uh, Kevin, I again, I'm like book dropping now, but I put a book out in the pandemic called Lead Care Win. And the reason I put that book out were they, they were my nine uh, empathetic leadership like lessons that we should be thinking about as a leader. And Work Life Bloom is like the sequel, but it's actually to your point of framework about empathy. You're the first person that I've talked to that I actually picked up on the architecture of this thing. So I wanted to thank you. You're right. Well, on that note, we should probably end because it can't get any better than that for Kevin. But uh, I, I, but I do want to shift gears. There's a couple more things I want to ask, and they're actually the things. If you're a longtime listener or watcher, you know I'm going to ask. And so, Dan, what do you do for fun? I'm a cyclist uh, first and foremost. So when I have my me time, these are ninety to ninety minute to four hour rides. Uh, love love getting on my bike. And I have three um, three kids, 20, 18, and 16, with my lovely, beloved, much better half, Denise. So there's a lot of family time. There's a lot of growing and learning what Gen Z's up to around here. And uh, that's that's just awesome. There you go. And so 
cycling, I also know uh, from our previous conversation and and uh, and question that I always ask as well is, what are you reading these days? Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. Dan Sullivan is a coach in Toronto, and uh, he wrote this book with Ben Hardy, who's amazing. 10x is easier than 2x. So it doesn't sound like a very leadershipy book. And I like, because I went solo uh, five years ago, I'm always looking at ways to run a, my business of one, what I call a company of one better. And, and Sullivan's book here is quite good from the perspective of a leadership or coaching entrepreneurs. So it's just something that um, a, another friend of mine recommended and I'm halfway in and it's, uh, it's quite good. Dan is known by many as one of the best coaches for entrepreneurs. So, which is, is a name that many people who are watching this, watching, listening to this might not know, but Dan's work is excellent and really can help us. Um, you know, he's, he's, I think, exceptionally good at, at coaching through writing. And so yeah. um, I, I would, I haven't read this. I just wrote it down. Uh, it'll be in the show notes, everybody, uh, along with a couple of other Dan's other books and probably some other stuff that he's mentioned as well. Uh, now the thing you've most wanted me to ask, uh, which is, okay, where can we learn more? Uh, where do you want to point people? If they want to get a, get a copy of work life bloom, learn more about your work, et cetera, where do you want to point them? You're such a kind gentleman. Uh, honestly, Kevin, thank you so much for this. Uh, quite easy. Worklifebloom.com is probably the easiest way. Uh, the The assessment is available. You can find out for free if uh, you're blooming, budding, stunted, or renewal as well. All right. Worklifebloom.com. Uh, you can learn more. Uh, I, I would encourage you to think about following Dan on one, of the, one or more of the social channels. Where are you most active? Where would you point people there? Well, uh, Twitter is a tire fire. So uh, I, I do believe that LinkedIn is the best spot and where a lot of uh, good dialogue, sensible business leadership dialogue is happening. LinkedIn. And uh, that's where some of you are watching this live. If you missed that at the beginning, everybody, um, as a podcast listener, you could be getting these live. Uh, so here, everybody, think about this. This book is coming out in the U.S. on November the 7th, 2023. We're having this conversation on July the 20th, fully two months before you could have possibly listened to it on the podcast. Why aren't you joining us live, everybody, in the future? You can't go back. We don't have a DeLorean, but we can do, <laughs> certainly change that for the future. Now, I have a question for all of you who are watching and listening. I ask it every single time we meet. It's two words. It's simple and it's important. The question is, now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this? Are you going to rethink uh, the idea of work-life balance? Are you going to think about that as integration rather than balance? Are you going to rethink uh, engagement? And what does it mean if you do that? And, and what ideas from this, specifically, what ideas from this conversation will you take action on? It's one thing to say, oh, that's good. Oh, that was useful. Oh, this was a good way to spend my time on the treadmill. No. The most important thing is what are you going to do as a result? Because if you don't take action if you only wanted entertainment, I mean, you could have probably done better, right? Uh, you might even have gotten a leadership lesson from Ted Lasso. But if you, but you, there's more here, but only if you take action, because at the end of the day, that's what will matter the most for you. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for being here. It was such, such a pleasure. So much fun. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. More, Kevin. Thank you kindly. Everybody, that's the end of this episode, but it's not the end of the journey. You can always go back. Like wherever you're listening to this, there's episodes you probably not heard. Why? Because there's 350 some of them. I get it, guessing you haven't watched or listened to all of them. So you can always go back, but certainly make sure that you subscribe and like and refer so others can join us. And so you don't make sure you don't miss any more episodes of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody.